Okay, if we uh, might begin uh, this morning by uh, looking at uh, Ezekiel chapter 9, and uh, we'll begin reading in verse 5, and we're going to read into chapter 10 and verse 7. So chapter 9, and beginning in verse 5 into chapter 10, verse 7, and we're going to be, the topic we're going to be thinking about, at least in the chapter 9 section, is the defiled house. And so beginning in verse 5, it says, And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children, and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Our Lord God, Wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house, when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory, and the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. And it came to pass when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubim, then he went in and stood beside the wheels, and one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubim unto the fire that was between the cherubim, and took thereof, and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. Now, we're looking at a, a chapter that um, is a, a symbolically predicting the judgment that would fall on the city of Jerusalem. And we might wonder, because there's a lot of slaughter going on here, and there are people dying, and it's men and women and children and uh, all ages, old men, young young men. And so, of course, in our world, you know, this kind of thing, this, this is what the atheists love. They love this kind of passage. They love to deride, as it were, the, the idea of God actually... Uh, the one behind this, he is commanding his angelic beings, as it were, with slaughter weapons in their hands to symbolically enact what's going to happen when the Babylonians invade the city of Jerusalem. But the simple answer is this, and we need to just keep reminding ourselves. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. <laughs> the soul that sinneth it shall die. Uh, in, in fact, it, back in the Garden of Eden, the Lord said to Adam and Eve, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so we have to remind ourselves that the overall background of this, the fact that any of us are alive is, is a miracle of divine grace. 
because the wages of sin, what we get when we sin, right? What we sow, this is what we reap. The wages of sin is death. So it's good to keep that at the back of our minds. Uh, and so because we're seeing things that seem to be a, a little bit uh, kind of, uh, well, it's just hard to read some of these passages. So as we consider these passages, um, we did cover uh, five and six last time, but I just by way of outline, just going to show you this little section from verse five um, down to verse seven. It's all about this judgment that these angels with slaughter weapons in their hands are to enact. And so the first thing we notice in verse five, uh, again, just by way of reminder, is the severity of the judgment. And so he says in verse five, and to the others, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city, smite, let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. And so this judgment is incredibly severe. No pity. The only ones spared, as we remember, are the ones that receive the mark, uh, that that uh, are marked by the man with the ink horn in his hand and wearing linen garments. And those are the ones that cried and sighed for the abominations that took place in the city of Jerusalem. Everybody else is not to be spared. My eye will not spare, uh, neither have ye pity. And then he says in verse six, and this is the scope of the judgment. So we've thought about the severity of the judgment, no pity. Now we think about the scope of the judgment. Who's going to who's gonna die here? He says, slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near my uh, any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. We, we notice another point here, the start point of the judgment. Where did this judgment begin? It says begin at my sanctuary. We know from 1 Peter, don't we? Chapter 4, verse 17, where it tells us judgment must first begin at the house of God. And in one sense, all of this corruption that is, in the city that has made it worthy of judgment began when the house of God itself became corrupt, when the priests became corrupt. They were meant to be teaching priests who were guiding God's people in the right ways. And if 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 those that are supposed to lead fail to lead, fail to give the example, it affects everybody in everything. And so we see how the tragedy here, uh, everybody's affected because of the failure in the house of God, begin at my sanctuary. And so it says, then they began uh, again in verse six at the ancient men, which were before the throne. And so the start point of the judgment. And now we want to look at the verse seven. And this is where really we, we, begin officially with <laughs> the last was really review he, he said unto them defile the house and fill the courts with the slain go ye forth and they went forth and slew in the city so the first uh, command here this is the slaughter of the judgment he says defile the house now it's good to remind ourselves that although the slaughter would indeed defile the temple all these dead bodies would actually have the effect of defiling the, the temple, the house of God. It's good to remember that it had already been defiled by the idolatrous practices that we were shown in chapter 8. The fact that they were worshipping the sun, the fact that the women were weeping uh, for Tammuz, the fact that uh, they, uh, they were in the very inner sanctuary, they had inscribed on the walls all kinds of creeping things which they worshipped. In other words, they had already defiled the house of God. Now their dead bodies, the ones who had basically enacted all this perversion, their dead bodies are adding to the defilement. The house is totally defiled. And under the Old Testament mosaic economy, uh, the touch of a dead body was indeed very defiling. I'd like us to go back to the book of Numbers just for a minute. I've actually been reading Numbers in my devotions and uh, just kind of always interesting when I'm studying somewhere else and then reading in my quiet time how they often fit together. And in Numbers 19, uh, we read about the defiling impact of a dead body. It says in verse 11, he that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days and so you think about this the whole of the sanctuary now is filled 
with dead bodies. <laughs> uh, that's the picture. And so how defiling is that? If if touching one dead body is defiling, the, the whole place is full of dead bodies. And of course, uh, chapter 19 introduces how was this defilement to be remedied? And it's the introduction of the the red heifer, this perfectly red heifer uh, that is used. It has to be burned and then the ashes are mixed. And, and then that's what is used to cleanse the defilement of the house. Kind of interesting. And so just as an aside, because we're, we're always interested in what's going on in Israel right now, Israel are, are desperate to begin to offer sacrifices again, but they cannot until they find a perfect red heifer because the place where they want to offer has been defiled by much dead bodies over many, many years. There's been a lot of defilement, and before they can actually begin to offer sacrifices again, the first thing that they will have to do is they will have to bring a red heifer, a perfect red heifer, and go through this ritual to cleanse so that they can begin to offer sacrifices again. So that's why there's so much fascination with finding this red heifer. It's, it's, it's You cannot reinstitute the sacrifices. Of course, uh, some people say, well, does the temple have to be rebuilt before they offer sacrifices? The answer to that is no. I'm just getting sidetracked here for a little minute. Uh, indulge me. But uh, when they uh, when the, the children of Israel went back after Babylonian captivity, they set up the altar and began sacrificing before they actually built the temple, Zerubbabel's temple. And interesting that in the New Testament, it talks about rebuilding again the tabernacle of David, which is broken down, not the temple of David, the tabernacle. So there's a possibility that they could, without a temple, reinstitute sacrifices in Jerusalem once they get a red heifer to clean the defiled house. Anyway, that's just a complete aside, uh, but not irrelevant just because we're talking about Numbers 19 and the uh, how defiling dead bodies are. So the house is totally defiled now. We, we get the picture here. Defile the house, fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. Now the command to go ye forth. Uh, and by the way, just look. At, let's look at the historic fulfillment. Remember, this is a symbolic uh, vision given to Ezekiel that is predictive of the actual destruction of the temple uh, by Nebuchadnezzar and his forces. So where do we actually see this take place? Let's just look at the literal fulfillment in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 And verses 17 through 19 is where this uh, symbolic vision given to Ezekiel would actually take place. And again, it's approximately six years after this vision will the actual fulfillment take place. And so he says in verse 17, Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and he had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. They burnt the house of God, break down the wall of Jerusalem, burn all the palaces thereof with fire, destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. So this is the literal fulfillment that would take place six years after this vision is given to Ezekiel and uh, the historic fulfillment of the symbolic vision that he has given. So he says, go ye forth, again here in verse 7. And that indicates having completed the slaughter in the house of God, the six executioners, uh, these angelic beings uh, with the slaughter weapons in their hands, were to continue this terrible work in the city. And so he says, go ye forth, and they went forth and slew in the city. So it begins first at my sanctuary, and then it spreads out and goes uh, and uh, into the city itself. And so... Uh, Therefore, he, he, he brought against them 
as we saw the king of the Chaldees, who killed uh, young men with a sword and so on and so forth. And notice he had no compassion on young men or virgin. Uh, the Babylonians had no absolutely no compassion. There was no mercy. And so that's the literal fulfillment of this beginning with the elders and priests who were responsible for the house, bringing it the sanctuary, and then spreading from there. And again, just to remind ourselves, these people had defiled God's house by their wicked lives, and now they would defile it further with their terrible deaths. And so their house is completely a defiled house. Now, I want you to notice in verse 8 through 10 now, we have... Ezekiel's response. And I want us to just, as we look at this response, I want us to remind ourselves that, do you remember that God gave him a, a hard head? He said, I'm going to make your head like a diamond, right? This kind of diamond tip forehead. And yet what we could see is that despite the fact that he was this hard headed preacher, he still has a soft heart. <laughs> he's got a hard head, but he's got a soft heart. And we see it illustrated here both very clearly. Verse 8 says, It came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left. So here he is watching this, that I fell upon my face and cried. And you can just sense some of the feeling in this. He cried. He, he, this is not some mundane uh, monosyllable prayer. This is this passion here. He cried and he said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? And so uh, the thoroughness of the slaughter just brings Ezekiel to, to be overcome. And he falls prostrate, crying out in horror to beseech God. He's overwhelmed, wonders if God will destroy all of Israel. Is anybody going to be left here? Despite this hard-headedness, he has compassion for these people. He's no merciless religious bigot. We can see this. Here's a man with a very, very tender heart. And of course, I think it's important for us practically as we preach messages of divine judgment, D.L. Moody said we shouldn't preach on hell without tears running down our cheeks. Now, of course, you can't manufacture cheer, tears. But the point is that we should have a tender heart even when we deliver a message of divine judgment, a heart of compassion for lost and dying people. And we're reminded of others, Abraham interceding, uh, over Sodom and Gomorrah. We have Moses when God was going to destroy Israel because of their rebellion and waywardness. And he, again, intercedes. And so you've got something of the heart of a servant of God. Uh, he, he understands God's righteousness. He understands God's justice. And yet he, 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 he really has a heart that's soft and burdened. Anguish. The anguish of Ezekiel seems to have caused the prophet to forget something important. Do you remember that there's a promise of a remnant? Do you remember that at the very beginning of chapter 9, there was this, this man with the ink on going through and marking those that sighed and those that cried. And yet in his anguish at seeing the slaughter, he says, is, is everybody going to be destroyed? Even though uh, God has clearly said that there is still a remnant that will be spared. And so, again, just how his anguish so overcomes him and so tenderhearted. So this is God's answer. Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel, this is verse 9, and Judah is exceeding great. And the land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth and the Lord seeth not. Now, it's almost the Lord is, as it were, throwing back in the faces of the leaders of the nation their own theological statement. When he says, they have said, if you look back to, we, we notice this in chapter 8, verse 12, uh, it says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. And so, again, he's quoting this now in chapter 9, verse 9. And what he's saying to Ezekiel 
is it not right that I'm doing this? The iniquity of the house of Israel is so great, it is well deserving of what I am about to do. Uh, it's exceedingly great. The house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. The land is full of blood. You see, the corruption of the leadership had already affected people greatly. Uh, you know, when, when, when leadership of a nation goes bad, it has a profound effect on people. Again, I think of our own society and we think of the, uh, just right now at the Democratic National uh, Convention, uh, there's Planned Parenthood buses driving around the city of Chicago offering free abortions to anybody who wants to murder their offspring. Would it be right for God to judge a nation like this? I want to tell you, it would be absolutely right to judge a nation like this. And so what he's reminding them of is these. this is what these people have done. They have filled the land with blood. They, 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 they're deserving of this. Their iniquity is exceedingly great. The city is full of perverseness. And I would say that would be true of every city in North America. If you look hard enough, you'll find perverseness is there, full of it. And so he's, again, seeing this. this and, of course, the reason behind this is their wrong theology. They say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, the Lord seeth not. They're denying his all-seeing eyes. He doesn't see. It's this, this kind of almost like this deist idea that God kind of set the world in motion and he's in the back room watching TV and just leaving it to, to fate, leaving it to men. And he's not really interested in his creation, which is completely wrong. And so here we find the nation sin has progressed so far uh, that it's impossible to avert disaster. In fact, later on, he's going to tell us that even if Noah, Daniel, and Job would have an intercessory prayer meeting, it's too late. <laughs> the city is too bad. Judgment alone must come. Denying God's omn omniscience, his interest in them, that he's just left them to it, they'd become, as it were, like this. He is interested in what goes on in a people and a nation. And so he says in verse 10, as for me, this is God's response to Ezekiel, as for me also, mine eye, the eye that they had just said does not see, he says, my eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, for I will recompense their way upon their head. Now, I want us to just notice, we, I hope we've, we've picked this up, but this is like a refrain. My, my eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. That is running through Ezekiel. That's probably why I love Ezekiel so much, because he loves repetition. And he has these little phrases that will say another one, that they might know that I am the Lord. I mean, and he just runs it all the way through his book. And so I just love that, because I love when I'm reading my Bible, I love observing repetition uh, because it's, it's there for a purpose to get our attention and so we notice for instance 511 ezekiel 511 uh, wherefore as i live saith the lord god surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations therefore will i also diminish thee neither shall mine eye spare neither will i have any pity chapter 7 verse 4 and mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity. But I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 7, verse 9. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways, and thine abominations that I are in the midst of thee, and you shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Uh, again, chapter 8 and verse 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Uh, we've seen it in chapter 9, verse 5. And to the others he said, in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. 
And then, of course, just here in chapter 9, verse 10. The one they said, seeth not, his eye, which is working really well, shall not spare, neither have pity. The eye, they said, didn't see. And so it says, I will recompense their way upon their heads. And again, we've said again throughout this study that ultimately what is happening in the land is that they are reaping what they have sown. That's really, it's the law of sowing and reaping. They have sown iniquity. They've sown sin. And what are the wages? If you sow sin, the wages of sin is death. This is exactly what is occurring. Now, verse 11, it says, And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. And so the inkhorn writer, we believe to be one of the angelic beings, perhaps superior to the other six, a higher rank of angel, who had been given the task of going through the land and putting a mark on everybody that sighed and everybody that cried. He is now reporting back to the Lord and saying, I have done exactly what you've asked, and I have made a mark on all those that sighed and cried. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, man, by his very nature, is wayward. And yet when it comes to the angelic beings, when they're given a task to do, they do it. And they report back and say, the task is accomplished. Or that we'd be more like them and be obedient to the tasks that God has given to us and do them. So that leads us nicely into chapter 10. And in chapter 10, we've got two things going on simultaneously that we want to observe as we go through this chapter. One is the departure of the glory of God. We're going to see that we said God is not going to share his glory with anybody. They've defiled the house. They filled it with idols. And so God has to leave. The glory of God has to leave. We call it Ichabod, the glory departing. Well, this is a picture of the glory departing. And subsequent to the glory departing, we're going to see the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by fire. And so these two things are given again to Ezekiel. Remember, he is carried in spirit to Jerusalem, and he is being given these visions of what God intends to do through his servant, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And so basically, uh, he's he's getting, as it were, a preview of what God is doing. And the reason why, the justice behind it, that's why he starts out by being shown in chapter 8 all the wickedness. So the chapter deals with the destruction of the city by fire, the fire of divine wrath, uh, which follows the departure of the glory of God from the temple complex. God is not going to share his dwelling place with other gods, and the sanctuary had been polluted with idolatry. God's worship center at Shiloh had been removed after his glory departed, and now his worship center in Jerusalem is also going to be destroyed after his glory departs. Let's just remind ourselves of Shiloh just for a moment, and we're going to look at um, 1 Samuel, a place where we we did visit in the past and uh, went through that marvelous book together. And we notice in chapter 4, and of course this is the worthless sons of Eli, and they're going out to battle, and they're taking with them the symbol of the very presence of God, the ark. And so uh, we notice in chapter 4, uh, they're in this battle, and it says, uh, verse 3, it says, When the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. And the people sent to Shiloh, that they might bring from, from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwells between the cherubim and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, they were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So they removed the Ark, the symbol of the divine presence, 
the symbol of the glory. Verse 10 and 11, the ark of God was taken, of course, captured. Two sons of, of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, are slain. And then we notice, uh, of course, uh, this amazing section in verse 19. Uh, it says, And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Now, I want you to notice, after the glory of God is gone, Ichabod, look at Jeremiah now, just for a second, Jeremiah 7. And this is very pertinent to our study here. Um, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7. Remember, Jeremiah is speaking to those still in Jerusalem at the same time as Ezekiel is speaking to those in captivity. And in chapter 7 uh, of Jeremiah, verse 12, it says, But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not, therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. The very same thing that I did to Shiloh. The glory is going to leave, and then the house is going to be desolate. And that's exactly what God did to Shiloh. That's what he's about to do to the temple at Jerusalem. Thankfully, we will say this, that unlike Shiloh, we can learn in the book of Ezekiel that the glory that departs will also return in a coming day in Ezekiel 43, and it will return to Jerusalem. And so it's not a permanent departure like it was from Shiloh, but nevertheless, it is a departure of the glory and the destruction of the house uh, here in the temple. So we might say this, chapter 9, the people in Jerusalem are slain. Chapter 10, the city itself is destroyed by fire. When is that fulfillment going to be? Well, let's look at 2 Kings now. 2 Kings, when is this vision that talks about the destruction of the city by fire? When is that going to actually occur? 2 Kings 25, verse 8 and 9. We read these words, it says, And in the fifth month, the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all the houses in Jerusalem, and every great man's house burnt he with fire. So this is the literal fulfillment, the human instrument we learn. But, but in this chapter, we learn that even though the human instrument is Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of his guard, we learn in, in Ezekiel chapter 10 that actually it's the divine will that this takes place that God is behind it. The servants are simply doing his will, even though they might well have been oblivious of the fact that they were doing God's will. Uh, I suppose if you'd have interviewed Nebuchadnezzar prior to the battle, do you realize you're doing God's will here? He would have just laughed at you. He's doing his own will, but he's actually doing God's will in accomplishing this. The, the one who is seated on the chariot throne. And so in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 10, we have this uh, kind of background to the destruction of the temple by fire. 
And so it begins this way in verse 1 and 2 with the instructions from the divine throne. Uh, so we're going to notice that, the instructions from the throne. And then in verse 3 through 14, we'll see the location of the throne. And so, sorry, 3 and 4, the location of the throne. Verse 5, we'll see the sound of the wings of the cherubim. And then verse 6 and 7, the implementation of judgment. So that's where we're headed in this little section. So notice he says, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared over them, as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen, and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. So these verses are kind of an introduction and serve as a, a preface, uh, if you like, to what's going to happen in verses 3 through 7. The vision is the same that we have already seen, this chariot throne, in chapter 1 and also in chapter 3. And now again, we're going to see the same vision. Although we will observe as we look at this vision, some minor additions and minor omissions, which we will examine because, you know, nothing in scripture is without a purpose. So if, if God gives the same vision, there's a reason for that. But if in that vision, there's something omitted or something added, there's always a reason as well. We've got to uh, try and figure out what's the significance. And so we'll try to do that as we look at this. But once more, we see that the one is seated on the throne. And this one who's seated on the divine throne is, is the one who calls to the man uh, with linen. So this is the man, remember, that had the ink horn, that had done his work uh, previously in chapter 9 and put a mark on those that sighed and those that cried. Now he has another uh, job to do. Uh, he's going to be given a new assignment, which is to cast coals of fire on the city so that it will be burned. Although there's these omissions and the, these additions, overall the vision is the same. And so there's consistency in the in, in it. And the reason is this, that man, men might understand this, that God is unchanging, whether in righteousness or in glory, or in any other aspect of his being, okay? So he doesn't change. He's the same being, consistent in his character, however he acts, whether in righteousness, whether in glory, whether in judgment, whatever. So there's one significant omission in the vision here, and that is that the bow that was mentioned in chapter 1, verse 28, he says uh, in 120, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so is the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. Now, you, you, in this chapter, you won't see any reference to the bow in the midst of the cloud on the day of rain. Just interesting that in our midweek conversational Bible reading, we are going through Genesis, and this last Wednesday, we did Genesis chapter 9, and we did God's covenant with Noah, and the token of the covenant, which was the bow in the cloud in the midst of the rain. <laughs> and of course, uh, we were just talking about, you imagine if you had come through the flood, that the next time it rained, because you'd never seen rain before the flood, then you see the, the the flood, the rains of the flood, and now you have your next rainstorm. Uh, unless you had that token in the sky of the bull, you'd be petrified every time it rained. You'd think, oh, here we go again. But God has said, I'm not going to destroy the earth in that way. And the bull is a, a symbol of God's grace and pres preservation. But what's interesting is, we're talking about the destruction of a city here. And so the bow is strangely absent because God is about to judge the city of Jerusalem, not just slaughtering the people, but also burning the city. 
And so that bow is significant in its absence uh, because, um, again, we said his eye is not going to spare, neither is he going to pity. There's no no grace on display here apart from the, the remnant that were marked with the ink on. That preservation of the remnant is the only symbol of of mercy here in the in the wrath. In wrath, remember mercy. That's the only evidence of it. So these cherubim, the, uh, in a sense, are living heavenly realities that were the 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 temple and the tabernacle kind of displayed them right over the ark of the covenant with a cherubim. Uh, in in the temple, we'll see later on in our study. We'll we'll notice that the temple was full of depictions of these cherubim, and um, so here they are. Not just the symbolic form in the temple, but this is the literal cherubim have now come to, as it were, ex escort the the divine presence, the glory of God, and remove His glory from the temple. So he says uh, in verse two, there's a new role now for this man clothed with linen. He's, he's successfully marked out the godly remnant who sigh and cry for the abominations in Jerusalem. And um, it was a ministry of grace and mercy, but his new work is now connected with divine judgment. So the command is given for the man in the linen garments to receive coals of fire from the cherubim. So again, verse two, he spoke to the man clothed with linen and said, go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, fill thine hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. Now, again, let's go back to Ezekiel chapter one, verse 13, where we see these um, hands of the cherubim mentioned. It says, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And so uh, kind of the, the whole symbolism of fire here coming from uh, from these, these creatures. And they bring coals of fire uh, and give them to the man who is clothed in linen. And the purpose is to purge the city of Jerusalem purifying it from all of this defilement that we've seen described in the previous chapter. Previously, we read Jerusalem would be judged by siege, slaughter, famine, and disease. Now we learn Jerusalem will also be burnt, and fire comes from the throne of, of the glory of God itself, coals of fire from among the cherubim to purge this city. And of course, we know that uh, this is exactly what took place because when we look at the book of Nehemiah, I want you just to see Nehemiah chapter 1, when Nehemiah is um, hearing about the state of the city of Jerusalem uh, from those that had just come there. And this is their description. They said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity, this is Nehemiah 1 verse 3, were there, there in the province are in great affliction and reproach the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. The gates thereof are burned with fire. That's why Nehemiah's task was so difficult, because uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his captain had done a magnificent job of fulfilling God's will in purging the city and destroying it. And that's exactly what we're seeing here being predicted. And as we saw in Second Kings, that uh, this king... Uh, de destroys it. Of course, it takes place 586 BC. It's literally fulfilled. It's good to remind ourselves from Hebrews 12, verse 29, our God is a consuming fire, right? The, his holiness. And so the coals, uh, we, we saw them in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, that they were used to purge the unclean lips of the prophet. Uh, now they're used to purge a wicked city, uh, the city of Jerusalem. In some ways, in Ezekiel's mind, I'm sure he probably thought of Sodom and Gomorrah. What God had done with that city, it seems like he was doing to his own city, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, this man uh, with the ink on, uh, the this angel of a higher rank. Now, some, by the way, have, have thought that 
maybe this man is a is a picture of Christ. Now I, I don't see that because I believe the one who is we've already seen who is seated on the throne, he is the pre-incarnate Christ. And this one comes and receives from it. But the reason they say that is because the judgments on earth in Revelation cannot take place until Christ opens the seals. And so they wondered, is this kind of a parallel? But uh, we would say, no, uh, he's just an angel of a higher rank who is given this responsibility. Now, he doesn't say that the man scattered the fire over Jerusalem, but the context certainly demands that. Uh, it, we can assume this is exactly what's taking place. Because um, he, he says um, in verse 2, fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. But then he doesn't, doesn't describe him actually doing it. But obviously he went in my sight to do as angels do what God tells them to do. So we can assume that that took place. Verse 3 and 4 now, we look at the the location of the throne. It says, Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court, and the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with a cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. So <clears throat> uh, we want to see something. First of all, just a, a, one little thing that we need to mention is that when we saw this vision in chapter one of these this chariot throne and these these cherubim, we weren't told actually by Ezekiel that they were cherubim. We actually were told they were living creatures. If you notice verse five, he says, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. And so he describes them. Again, verse 13 through 15, as for the likeness of the living creatures. And so verse 14, the living creatures. He never calls them cherubim until we get to chapter 10, and we learn that they're cherubim. Now, the question, of course, is, why this change of name? Why living creatures in chapter one, cherubim in chapter 10? And by the way, the fact that they're the same is confirmed by verse 20. Notice verse 20. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar, and I knew that they were the cherubim. How did he know that they were the cherubim? when he doesn't mention it in chapter one. I just wonder, is it because Ezekiel was shown in vision the insides of the walls of the sanctuary? Remember, he was a priest, but he never actually practiced as a priest. And he would never have gone in and seen these cherubim. But when he was taken into the sanctuary, and remember, he saw that they had inscribed on the walls all these living creatures, uh, you know, these these creeping things and stuff. But he would have also seen that on those same walls were the cherubim. How do we know that? Let's just look back at First Kings now for a moment. First Kings. And we just notice a few things in chapter six. It's interesting in our assemblies, we have a lot of teaching on the tabernacle and uh, heard men do ministry on the tabernacle. I've only ever heard one person ever speak on Solomon's temple, <laughs> and that was on a CD, and it was a guy from Northern Ireland called Albert McShane. Actually, it was a great series of messages on the Solomon's temple. But um, here we got the description of what the, the, the temple was like. And so it says in verse 29, and he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers within and without. Uh, look at chapter 6, verse 35. It says, and he carved thereon cherubim and palm trees and open flowers, covered them with gold, fitted upon the carved work. Chapter 7 and verse 29 it says, and on the borders that were between the ledges were lions, oxen, and cherubim. And upon the ledges there was a base above, and beneath the lions and oxen were certain additions made of thin work. So he's describing what, 
what Solomon's temple looked like. And one thing we can say is that there were lots of cherubim de decorating the temple of Solomon. And so here's Ezekiel. He's never seen inside. But now in spirit, God takes him and he shows him inside. And he sees these depictions of cherubim, perhaps for the very first time. And then he thinks of the vision he saw in chapter one, and a light bulb goes on. Oh, that's what they are. They're not just living creatures. They're actually cherubim. That's what they are. And so he's able to describe that with clarity. And so uh, in verse three, he, he says in chapter 10, now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house and the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. So um, there, uh, these cherubim there, uh, we notice that the, the, in verse four, the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold. Go back with me to chapter nine, verse three. It says the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink on by his side. So what we see here is um, when you compare these two, 9-3 uh, with 10-4, um, it hasn't moved. It's still in the same place. The, the, the glory of God is just suspended over the threshold of the house in both instances. And it would seem likely that the two statements are concerned with the same action. The repetition is simply to underline the continuity of the activity and remind the reader of the reluctant and prolonged process which accompanied the departure of the glory of God. It's, it's not a fast thing. He's doing it quite slowly. He hasn't moved. And, and so both visions, slaughter of the people of God, followed by the burning of the house of God, the the uh, glory of God is still in the same location. It has not moved. It will. Now we're going to see it later on in chapter 10, but it hasn't moved from the threshold of the house at this point. It's going to go to the Mount of Olives presently. But the glory of God comes um, from the cherubim, goes to the threshold of the house, and the whole place is filled with the glory cloud. Just as when God came and took up his residence in the tabernacle and then in the temple, the glory cloud filled the place. Now, as God is leaving, the glory cloud is leaving as well. Uh, the very same uh, scene as we saw when it, it came into the house is now seen as it leaves the house. Of course, Isaiah's vision, the whole house was full of his glory. A glory of God filling the house, but now it's leaving the house. It's on the threshold uh, of the house. The presence presence of the Lord was as glorious in his departure as it was in his entrance. Just the same as the Lord Jesus, his entrance into the city of Jude, Jerusalem was pretty glorious. If you think of the triumphant entrance, but he was no less glorious when he left the city. The Lord is glorious in his departure, as well as his entrance. And our departure has arrived. Our time has gone. May the Lord encourage us, at least as we think of these things, of the righteousness and justice of God, and the fact that if it wasn't for his mercy, we'd all be dead men too. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.